Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. You know the name Marion Miley? If not, then prepare to meet someone so special, you'll never forget her. This young golfer in the 1930s had it all. Brains, beauty, a powerful swing, of course, and a winning personality. It seemed only a matter of time before this 27-year-old phenom achieved immortality in golf on the links by winning a national championship. But fate, as so often happens in history, had other plans. Marion's life was cut tragically short during a botched robbery, and because this death happened only a few weeks before Pearl Harbor, her death was forgotten by the time the war was over, with so many other dead to mourn and a world to rebuild. And it's worth noting that the press loved Marion during her life. Think about being a reporter during the Great Depression, or think about being somebody paying out your dime to pick up a newspaper. You didn't want to open it up and just read more about bread lines and skyrocketing unemployment, not to mention that jerk with the mustache over in Europe causing all that trouble. You wanted something uplifting. And that's what Marion's story was. And I think the fact that she always had time for those boys in the press says a lot about her. She cared about uplifting people and she had a positive attitude. Sometimes athletes, heck, sometimes any of us, don't want a microphone shoved in our face when we've just suffered a loss but she always made time for them even when she came agonizingly close to winning that ultimate goal. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis, and this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. Remember, this is where you come to find forgotten figures in history like Marion Miley. We bring them back for you to learn from and to be inspired by, just like people were 80 years ago all over the world. You can visit me at historyauthor.com or on Twitter at History Dean. Also find me on Instagram and Facebook. I want to really thank especially the YouTube subscribers. Today's show is going to have a lot of visuals. So if you're watching on video, you'll be able to see those and they really add something to this legend. Our guest is Beverly Bell. She brings us the novelized version of Marion's true story. It's called The Murder of Marion Miley book is a finalist for the 2020 U.S. Golf Association's Herbert Warren Wind Book Award. That's the highest literary honor that the USGA gives. This book describes in vivid detail this young woman from a bygone era who enchanted fans in the 1930s, and it explores not just her death, but her life. She was so inspiring. She is not somebody who didn't have flaws. She's not somebody who was, oh gosh, so perfect. But I think you'll see why once we talk to Beverly K. Bell, people just fell in love with her. She was called the American ideal. And she really was that. But more than that, she was just a great person. So the search to bring her killers to justice when you read it in the novel really takes on added significance. And even that's not the story that you might expect. Her life was just so short, but so full. And I think that that's how you'll feel once you read the novel. Beverly Bell is an award-winning magazine and crime writer herself. You've seen her work in Arizona Highways, Indianapolis Monthly, Keeneland Magazine, and Kentucky Monthly. She also served as a consultant at the Kentucky Educational Television's documentary, Forgotten Fame, The Marion Miley Story. You can visit her at beverlykbell.com and from there find her social media accounts and see even more about this forgotten American legend. Okay, now that we've stepped out of our time machine onto the best golf courses that the 1930s have to offer, let's join Beverly Bell and investigate the murder of Marion Miley. I'm joined via Zoom by Beverly Bell. She's the author of the book you can see right here behind me, The Murder of Marion Miley. Thank you so much for making the time to chat with the History Author Show. Thank you, Dean. I am so excited to be talking with you today. 
<laughs> so am I. And look at you. You're bouncing up and down. See, I am. The, I'm bouncing. These are the, thing, <laughs> these are the things you can only see via YouTube, right? Or <laughs> watching on Zoom. The danger of having a swivel chair, too. I can, you know. <laughs> not making any noise. That's good. That's good yeah. to see. So or rather good not to hear. But I like that you have bring so much energy to your topic. And we can already see that here before you spoke a word. You are so dedicated to telling this story, this lost story, this true story. And even in the way that you discuss it, it's really colorful language. You are a real wordsmith, as they used to say. I don't know that anyone says that anymore, but as you can see from the books, I live in the past. So sure, I'll say wordsmith and watch fob and all kinds of old things. But it's a sincere compliment. You put things together so well. And one of those ways you describe the book is you talk about breadcrumbs as you were following the story, as you were getting on the trail. The first breadcrumb was the book, or rather was an old newspaper article, which is also something that I love. So here you end up publishing the book, but it starts with this simple thing, just somebody handing you a historical artifact. And it's great to be there at that moment of Genesis. Then none of us have to go do all that hard work. You do it for us. And all of us just pick up a copy of the murder of Marion Miley, and we get to enjoy the fruits of that bit of inspiration. So sprinkle out that first breadcrumb for all of us that are listening today and explain to us, what do you hope will hook them? Will it be what hooked you or something else about the story of Marion Miley's untimely death? Well, the hook to me was just the fact that it's a great story. It's an unbelievable one, but it's very real. There's no fiction to this um, telling in terms of the, the basic facts. And it seemed like the more that I researched it, the, the um, more of the, the different aspects that I found, I, I told uh, somebody that when I was doing the basic research on this story, every time I would dig at a particular nugget, it rewarded me. And uh, when, when you have that kind of um, reinforcement uh, to tell a story, it, it's easy to get pulled into it. And I, that's certainly my hope for readers, that they'll get pulled into it the way I initially was. Well, and speaking of pulling in readers, I was going to ask you to pull us in with your very top of the novel because you give a real vivid description of, I don't know, it's vivid, yes, but it's also very detailed of the damage done by the two bullets that steal away Mary and Miley's life. And you weave in not just the physical attributes, so it's not made clinical, but also, you give us details and what it would have meant to her, stealing away the various parts of her personality, of her knowledge. Her, she wrote poetry. She dreamed of being a doctor or planned, I guess you'd say. She, she wasn't somebody who just idly sat there and picked the daisies or whatever the flower you have there in, in Kentucky is and dreamed of things. She was going to do it. And it was just a matter of time before she fulfilled her dreams. And that makes her murder at this young age of 27 all the more tragic because she did have so much to give the world, not just the world of golf or the world of sports in general. She, she just was a person that you really brought to life for me here in the murder of Marion Miley. So read that passage to us now at the very top, the first couple of paragraphs. Give us an idea of your writing and also put us off on that right foot, finding that first breadcrumb. All right. September 28th, 1941. 3.30 a.m. The first bullet entered her back on the left side of Marion's spine, tearing through the lower fibers of her trapezius muscles, the beautiful piece of flesh that controlled her shoulder blades, those same shoulders that made possible the textbook turns in her golf swing, rotating from right to left. Those who knew nothing about golf or anatomy always assumed Marion's power and distance off the tee came from her toned arms or the strength of her grip. Those people were wrong. This, the once sinewy, well-knitted tissue, was the source 
bullet ripped through Marion's pectoralis major and exited three inches above her left breast. The second bullet hit the parietal lobe of her brain and grazed the motor cortex, which controls body movement and coordinates motor skills. It decimated the ability of Marion's hands and eyes to work seamlessly with the club and ball. She would never again deliver a 250 yard drive down the middle of the fairway or land a delicate pitch on the front of the green, rolling it up within two feet of the hole. Every shot, every stroke, every putt that had to occur in time and sequence, they were all gone now. Well, part of me just wants you to continue reading, even though I've already read the book, because <laughs> it's always nice when you ask somebody to read on the air, because you're used to dealing with these words on the printed page. But I knew I could trust you to do it very well, because she is so alive to you, clearly, is your subject. And that opening, I don't think I've read one like it before. It accomplishes a lot, but it also takes some risks, because some people might pick that up and say, oh gosh, I'm opening with something so grisly and tragic. And you didn't shy away from that. And it is important because it is her ultimate fate. But then in the rest of the book, we do get to know her as she was in life. And I know I certainly did. And now when I look at the pictures of her, I feel as if she could just speak to you from the pages of history. And that's something unique. It's something that everybody doesn't share in those pictures. When you look at a picture of an older person, they may not seem as if they're really just jumping to speak at you. And that's the case with Marion Miley. Those small details, they hammer out so much of the story that is to come. And you chose to go through, for instance, her medical desires or medical plans, as you mentioned earlier. And there's one detail though in there that eventually comes and that's the bite mark. There is a bite mark that is discovered later. And I thought that that's one of those small details, just heartbreaking once you, once you get into her story a little bit, and we're not giving anything away to tell that, but what does it reveal to you? Where did you first describe that if you remember it or first discover that? And what does it tell you hey, I can write about this as an author and this will really tell my readers something about this young woman. I first learned about the bite mark and for those who are listening and may not uh, understand, uh, it was uh, a bite mark on one of the three men who were responsible for, for this crime. And uh, I learned about it in the transcripts of the trial. And, you know, I, I read it and read it again. And, and then I understood what the significance was. It is, it is a very unusual aspect of this story as, as maybe a, uh, it would be for, for any kind of crime. It was such a small thing but as you said, it was so important um, to the story. And, um, you know, my writing has sometimes been described as that I have a very light touch. Um, I won't keep driving at something. I fully expect the reader to get it. You know, I, I, I don't want to hit um, anybody over the head. Uh, you know, with, with my writing. And uh, even on this manuscript, I had to go back and, and make some changes on that because maybe it was too light. Uh, I wasn't being direct enough. But, you know, that aspect of the story conveys so much. And really, in the reading that I did, in that first page and a half, I really wanted to capture who she was. I wanted the reader to understand who she was from the get-go. And I also wanted to convey her medical ambitions, the, the fact that she wanted to be a doctor. So that, you know, that uh, factored in to some of my description. But honestly, you can read the, that first page and a half and, and you can get a summary of, of what um, she was about. And I'll tell you that I did 
um, I had several different beginnings to the book. Um, and I finally just decided on this one. And, and this was, um, this was the way to go. Yeah, I was going to ask about that because you could have begun the murder of Marion Miley with her alive, with her on the links, with her coming just one stroke short, say, for example, from that one national championship that she's going for, rather than earlier in the, in the botched robbery when this is the moment that it happens and the bullet is literally hitting. You chose to start it right there. And I wanted to ask about that because she is someone so full of life and you could argue for one way, the way that you chose to do it, which is in the middle, begin in the middle, right? Or you could argue that, oh, it'd be nice to get to know her just a little bit beforehand, and then then the tragedy really hits us. So what were, now that you've revealed to us, you had some other openings, what was the ultimate choice that made you decide, oh, okay, this is the right choice, this is the one I want to pick, I'm going to start it right in that moment? The fact that she wanted to be a doctor kept playing in the back of my mind. I didn't know quite how to deal with it. And for whatever reason, I, I really started drilling down on how she was injured. You know, what, what did the first bullet do? You know, what did the second one do? What parts of the body did each of those bullets go through? And the fact that, you know, one of them was um, shot at point blank range uh, into her brain, that's obviously devastating. That's, that's life ending. Um, so I really just started studying anatomy for, a, a, I guess it was kind of a few days when I was really reading about it and the light bulb went off. And I thought, this is it. This is how I do it. Um, and I can capture the fact that Marion, if it were any other individual, her natural instinct would have been a clinical one to kind of study it. What happened to the body? How did it break down? How did it end? And I was just so um, happy with it once I figured out how to do it. Um, it might be considered an unusual choice, but I do feel like then, then we're allowed to, to go through the um, aftermath of the crime and to really capture the feelings and what, how some of the people who loved her so much were, were struggling with her death with her sudden death because it was, it was just overwhelming. It was so shocking um, and just so tragic. And, and I think that through those people, through those people who loved her, um, I could still capture all that life. I, I could just bring it full circle. Um, it's interesting, um, but the way the book ends right now was actually one of my beginnings. And, and um, a good so for anybody who, uh, you know, gets really to that last page, that was the original beginning of the book. <laughs> well, I have mentioned before on the show in interviews, I don't read all the way to the end of a novel because I never want to risk giving away too much. So now I could just end this interview and finish up the murder of Marion Miley yeah. because it is so excellent. I, really relate. I guess I'm one of those people now who just admires and really loves her and just thinks she's had so much to give. She's so vividly alive after reading your book. And she was so precious to the people of the Great Depression at the time in that little corner of Kentucky. And I wanted to ask you about that. What did she mean to the people there, but also the wider nation? What did amateur golf mean? Because it was quite different from pro golf today, from the tour. What, what was it about her that she, she made people say, well, let's follow her, let's read all those pieces of paper and let's, let's have, she made good copy as they say, right? What was it about her? What did she mean when she was alive before her tragic end? I suppose a basic answer to that question would be that everybody loves a winner and and Marion was a winner in terms of just being this elite level 
golfer. Um, women's golf was very, very popular in the 1930s. In 1930, um, Bobby Jones, one of the iconic uh, male, uh, male golfers, he decided to retire. And um, so that actually kind of created an opening for women's golf. Uh, you know, I, I've said before that for most of us, we have this um, sort of one concept of the 1930s. You know, the Great Depression, Dust Bowl, it was, you know, it, it was a hard, hard time. But Marion's story is not that story. I think that's one of the, uh, one of the reasons uh, why a lot of people find it appealing. So um, she was incredibly young. She won her first tournament when she was 17. Um, and she'd only taken up the game five years earlier. So that's, that's kind of saying something. She, um, she was very pretty, um, brown hair and kind of streaked by the sun, uh, blonde streaks. She had these um, great dimples, uh, great smile. She was extremely personable. One of the, of the, uh, things that was written about her frequently was her ease in managing reporters, um, newspaper guys, uh, you know, answering their questions, even when they were difficult ones. So, you know, she was very smart. She was um, athletic. She had um, abilities in other sports. So it was just this wonderful combination that just lifted her and, you know, made her one of these really visible people um, in, in the golf world and, and beyond. It, it wasn't, you know, it certainly wasn't just Kentucky, although Kentucky was very proud of her. Um, it was the country and she competed internationally. Um, it's also one of the, you know, reasons that her, um, her murder was covered so extensively all over the world. So um, she was just a great ambassador, I think. Um, she only moved to Kentucky when she was um, 16 uh, and lived there until um, her death at 27. But geez, what, what inroads she made. She, she traveled all over the state trying to promote the game. Um, so it, it was a loss um, felt all over the world when, when she was killed. And she did more than just play the game. So people are thinking, well, I'm not particularly into golf and I don't really golf. I, I hit one really great putt once in front of a, a guy I know that golfs really well. And I was like, that's it. And that was, I think I was 16, maybe 15. I played it, I played it really well because I guess I had some temporary uh, ability to play. But I don't want people to think they have to, be a golfer to understand what she gave us and to enjoy the, if you could say enjoy right before your title, which is the murder of Marion Miley. That's with all capital letters. Nobody enjoys her actual murder, even one of the gentlemen who was involved in it. So that tells you something. But you mentioned there that she didn't start playing when she was a child. You said that she started playing when she was 12. So I guess that's still a child, but not, not a little tiny mm -hmm. kid like we think of tiger woods right we all saw that video of him when he was just really small small in the club so, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and hitting it so i thought that that was interesting and it gives us a way to talk about her parents because her father's a golf pro and you can see where he might have been out there with her we might picture him if we were watching a bad lifetime movie i don't know that there are good lifetime movies particularly but if i ever go back into tv i guess i can't work for lifetime but i don't think i'm the demo anyway <laughs> but you could see her being out there with him and he's hitting her with the club and demanding she play and you're gonna hit again hit again hit again hit again just being really terribly driven and somewhere on that spectrum so it leapt out at me that she doesn't start playing until the age of 12. And yet 
she becomes so good. Here, her father, her father played when the U.S. Open, didn't he? When in uh, 1910 mm-hmm. or 12 or something. So, how does she fall in love with the game? And what does the fact that she's not pushed into golf tell us about her relationship with her father? And then we'll get to her mother in a moment. Her, yeah, her father, Fred Miley. She she was the uh, only child of, of Fred and Elsie Miley, and it does say a lot that. Fred, who was a golf pro and worked at a number of country clubs um, around the country, did not teach her the game until she was 12. The, the way I read that, and, and yeah, some, some people would go, what, 12, you know, that's still, you know, awfully young, but your point about Tiger is, is spot on. You know, most parents who play at a competitive level of a sport, they will introduce their child to that sport at an earlier age than 12. I think it speaks volumes that Fred waited until she was 12. What I think it says is that he was waiting for the game to come to her. Um, uh, Excuse me, not for the game, for her to come to the game. And... um, I think it was a situation where he was not forcing it upon her. He was not, like you said, oh, you're, you're going to take up this game. Just let things develop and unfold. Um, he, he, was, he was a talented golfer. I will tell you, Marion was a better golfer. Um, and so, you know, it, it was everything to Fred. He was so proud of her, his only child, um, how good she was, how quickly uh, she elevated to the national level and, and beyond. Um, and um, so I, I think it's to his credit. Um, there, was, there was no browbeating. Everything that I've read, uh, the research that I've unfolded, it tells me that, that they had a, a very good relationship. Um, she, she and Fred and she and her mother, uh, they were a tight family. And um, I think it, it probably was a good thing for her, for her game that he approached it with her the way he did. It makes that picture or any of the pictures you see of the three of them together all the more heartbreaking after you read the murder of Marion Miley and you know what's coming and they're just all smiles. And it's also important to remember that this is a time when you weren't making a million dollars because you won this or that tournament. You weren't making much of anything. She goes and works for Standard Oil and people are probably thinking as I was, wait a minute, now she's doing that? She packed so much into that brief life that she had. But she wasn't able to take care of her parents. It wasn't going to be a situation where they were struggling with her money and they mismanaged it and there was any of that bad stuff. In fact, that's not the source of this robbery that goes wrong. It's not that they think that they're millionaires. And we'll, again, tease that in just a minute. But I put on, as you pointed out when I first answered the Zoom call, my Kentucky Blue today. And I have my I have my hat. This is not a Kentucky Blue hat, but it's closest that I had unless I wanted to wear this. And I... I showed you, I said, this is just a little too Kentucky Colonel for me. So I didn't, for me to wear on air anyway, I I wear it proudly otherwise. But I got this from Keeneland Racetrack and you've written for Keeneland Magazine. And I wanted to bring that up because being at the racetrack and knowing that it was new at the time, knowing the story and the history behind it that I really delved into when I was there in Lexington made me feel a little bit closer to Mary and Miley in life and think about what her life would have been like at the time, what the ground she would have walked. She's also an equestrian. Again, she's, she's just such a vivid person. She would make a great character in a novel, but if it was just all fiction, but you might think, oh, bit of a Mary Sue. She sort of does everything. She's good at everything. Everyone loves her. Even the media loves her. They thank her for, for giving them breaks on stories. And, but she was quite real. And so, I felt closer to her in retrospect, having known that I went there. So I wanted to ask you about that because I know that in your research, you traveled many of these places that she had been to and they speak to you more, of course. So a place like Keeneland, a place like Lexington Country Club where she meets her untimely end, 
what does it say to you or what do you hope your book will say to readers when they go say to Keeneland and they place a bet or they go and they play a few rounds at the Lexington Country Club? What do you hope that her world still being around and a lot of it still being preserved will say to readers after they finish the murder of Marion Miley and maybe they want to go to the hit the bourbon trail or something like that? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, having those places still exist, it, 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 it was such a gift to me as, as a writer that I could go to the Lexington Country Club. I could see um, where Marion and her mother lived in, in an apartment on the second floor of the Lexington Country Club. Fred Miley had been the golf pro uh, at the Country Club before taking a, a better paying job at a club in Cincinnati. But Marion and her mother stayed there because Elsie uh, Miley was the office manager. So, you know, I'm able to go up to the second floor of the Lexington Country Club. That space has now uh, been uh, changed to the ladies' locker room. But um, there are certain aspects of it uh, that are exactly the same. And that's just incredible when you're trying to write a historical novel um, to, to have years ago. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, this, this crime took place in 1941 and you could go to the Lexington Country Club today and, and see the spot um, where uh, Marion died. Um, there's also uh, another um, house um, across from the Lexington Country Club. Uh, it had been a tuberculosis, um, kind of a, a sanitarium. And um, Mrs. Miley, who was also shot in this crime, crawled from the Lexington Country Club to that structure, which now is a private residence. And it looks virtually the same um, as it did in 1941. Um, you mentioned Keeneland. You know, Marion also was, a, uh, was very good with horses. Um, and she liked to ride and her father did not want her to ride because she, he was afraid she would get hurt. Um, Keeneland is, is one of the most beautiful thoroughbred tracks um, in the country. Um, just, um, just hosted the Breeders' Cup, had hosted it um, five years ago when American Pharaoh, the Triple Crown winner, uh, also won that. Um, so it, it is a, a beautiful historical track. And the interesting thing, uh, which I, I really uh, love you focusing on that, was, you know, Marion not only loved horses, but she loved to gamble. Um, she wasn't a drinker, but she loved uh, to gamble. She gambled um, on dog racing, she played poker, she obviously, um, um, horse racing. And uh, so you can, um, you can just appreciate those aspects of her personality, as well as the details of the story, you know, having some of these places still exist. You certainly know this far better than I do, but in, in so much of, of writing that uh, has a historical bent, many times those places are lost, they're gone. Um, and, and that's just not the case with, with this story. So I, I feel very fortunate because I think it only adds um, to how compelling it is as a story. Especially something like the sanitarium or the clubhouse where nobody wants to have a building around that's associated with a grisly murder. It's very easy to get rid of it at the time and just put something new there, put a parking lot there. And though that's your picture of the sanitarium that I'm going to put up because you say it looks so similar today in, and mm -hmm. somebody lives there. That wasn't the site of the murder, but it is significant to the story where her mother has to crawl mm -hmm. there. So it is nice that it's preserved. And I, I just found all of Lexington to be, such a trip into the past. So nice to be able to go and even Henry Clay, you see where he's buried, that big, beautiful right. mausoleum that he has and things like that. So it is definitely worth the trip. And now one more reason. I wish 
I, I certainly would have gone back and I would be doing this interview in person if it wasn't for COVID-19. So when I come back again, maybe you'll have your second book written and we can chat about it then. <laughs> I'll be glad to take you around to the different sites, including, of course, the, the entire Mount Miley family is, is buried um, yeah. here. I'm sorry, I didn't get to pay my respects, but I didn't know her yet, but I have. Thanks to the book you're enjoying me discussing today with Beverly Bell called The Murder of Marion Miley. U.S. Golf Association historian Michael Trosel writes of the book, Beverly Bell's engaging and meticulously researched book explores the twists and turns in the hunt to find Marion Miley's killers in one of the nation's most sensational murder cases. The Murder of Marion Miley is a story all golf fans should know. Beverly, that's high praise from the golf world yet again, and somebody who knows the history of golf so well. So I wanted to bring it back to people who don't follow the game of Kings because I want to drill down on that. This is a story that I think anybody could enjoy. It's not a murder mystery because we know the end there, but it's a story that can pull you in. I think you can find anything to link into, even if it's just her being someone who likes horses and, oh, I like horses, or, oh, hey, I like the 40s, so I'll read that. It has so much. So I wanted you to speak to those readers. What are you hearing from them, and what are you saying to them when they tell you, gosh, I never picked up a golf club or watched the Masters in my life, but I wish I'd met Marion Miley in life. I, it's so terrible what happened to her. How do you feel as an author when you hear that? Well, it, it's it's the best, um, you know the 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 compliments uh, that that I've received from people who have never played the game and said, you know, how much they loved it. Again, I, I just I, I just think it speaks to the strength of of the story and and the story that was, you know, totally forgotten. Uh, you know, it, it um, you know. No one had, you know, ever put anything together at, you know, book length, uh, a focus uh, on on Mary and the person. So, uh, you know, of course, that's um, that's what you want to hear, right? Um, you know, I often have thought of it in terms of, you know, this this book is, you know, it's a it's a journey um, through her life through uh, the people who loved her and, and what they experienced when, when she died through the, through the trial, um, you know, after the arrest, um, the conviction of, of these three men and, and all the twists and turns that, you know, uh, that took it, um, you know, that's the journey. The vehicle maybe is golf. Um, but, you know, when we're going on a long journey, we don't necessarily uh, need to know everything about that car uh, or that SUV. Um, we, um, we just, we just want to take the trip. And, um, you know, I, I certainly weave in uh, uh, all of her significant accomplishments, and there were so many when it came to her golf game. Um, but the story itself is, is broader than that. Did you ever consider telling it as a nonfiction story? Because you clearly did so much deep research and I almost feel when we say it's a novel that I should have a little speech bubble pop up over my head and say, no, it's, it's, but it's okay because it's, it's, it's based on so much of the real history and she did all of her research and all of her walking the grounds and there's not suddenly a robot or anything crazy like that in there or a, or a weird love <laughs> affair or any kind of thing like that that you shoehorn in. So did you ever consider writing it as nonfiction and did you have any concerns about telling it in a novel and think, gosh, I, this thing you care about so much doing her justice might be watered down by people who think, oh gosh, she, she was a real person. I thought this was fiction. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, of course I, I thought, um, long and hard, uh, about it. I tried it. I, I tried to write it as nonfiction, but what I realized is I couldn't do it because I wanted um, what dialogue could give me in terms of what the characters, um, and I, I use that term loosely because 
everybody in the book is based on a real person with the, with the exception of one, um, you know, what they were feeling and, and struggling with. And, you know, I, I, I wrote, I don't know, I might've written maybe a hundred pages or something um, as nonfiction and it was totally flat and, and I hated it. Um, and I just thought, no, this isn't it. Um, and then when I started thinking about a different approach, uh, because it is, you're absolutely right, it is so weighted in facts. Um, the, the foundation is totally built on facts from who Marion was, to, uh, her accomplishments, um, her you know, victories, her defeats, um, the, what was going on in, in the world, which is, is a really, um, it, that was a really fun aspect for me to, to be able to incorporate some of those things. So it is totally uh, based in, in fact, what the dialogue provided was the feeling. And um, so I, I, I was happy with it. I, I was happy with it uh, once I decided on this approach and, you know, even uh, for the dialogue, which, you know, obviously is, is my creation, you know, when you get to the, the trials, uh, a lot of that is, is straight out of the transcripts of, of the trials. So I was even able to incorporate it then, um, you know, and to, use, to, to use those facts to, to build the story. And her diary as well. So you've got a real sense of her oh, voice. Yeah, her, her diary. Yeah, that... Um, that was that was so um, important. It was very minimal. It was only a couple of lines, but you know, even a, a couple of lines for each day, it, it reveals so much. You had mentioned that she worked for Standard Oil because um, at that time there was no professional golf circuit for women. It was only amateur, and you you didn't get paid. So these young women still had to figure out how they would, um, you know support themselves if, uh, you know, some of them were married and so they could uh, pursue their amateur uh, golf ambitions, but a lot of them weren't. Um, so I found it very interesting uh, in the diary where Marion is working for Standard Oil, again, which was a, um, you know, kind of an unusual um, thing for a, for a woman. And she was, um, probably in a public relations capacity. She, she was traveling around the country inspecting um, different uh, Standard Oil stations. And, but she would meet with leaders of that community and she would go play golf. And this is the part that really, every time she played golf, which was very often with these local leaders or, um, you know, if it was a, another athlete who happened to live in the area or, you know, some sort of an official, she always put down her golf score, which I, in her diary, which I found so interesting that, um, you know, yeah, she was doing this, but this golf thing was still very important. And uh, of all the things to, if you're only given a couple of lines uh, in a, in a diary to write about your day, you're going to write in that golf score that tells you what, what was important to her. You mentioned what was happening in the world at large and the date of her death of her murder is September 29th of 1941, which to the people at the time, they wouldn't have known anything, but we know in retrospect that it's only five weeks before Pearl Harbor and that the whole world is going to change. As I was doing my research into your book and I subsequently have seen the cover of the New York Times elsewhere, but I saw that the day after her murder, when the news hits, the New York Times puts it on page one, column two, above the fold. So a really prominent spot, even the, even what the Nazis are up to is all the way over on the other side of the paper. So it tells you a lot in that moment about exactly what you mentioned about what's going on in the world at that time. Mm -hmm. Here she is the second most important thing, arguably, that's going on in the United States at the time and what's going on over 
over in Europe is not that important. In fact, there's one journalist who writes in a column that, hey, if they drop their bombs as accurately as as, as Marion hits her putts, then, you know, the, the war is going to be a short thing. And the fact that they say that to me, it's a clever little bit of writing, but you're thinking they're writing that at the time. People are dying over in Europe. Countries are being overrun by the Nazis. And yet you feel totally comfortable saying, oh, hey, let me write this clever little comparison, everybody. <laughs> let me compare the way that this golfer sinks balls into the cup to dropping bombs. It's just a little thing like that. But it gives you an idea of what was real. And Marion Miley was just so real to people in those days. And that really struck me. Her parents come alive so much, the sanitarium, all of that. Since her trial is on December 8th, 1941, which is the day after the Day of Infamy, we can see the, the path. We can hear the wind of history blowing that's going to blow away her story. So tell us a little bit about that. How did that timing of her slaying contribute to Marion's life falling out of the national memory? Well, um, you know, Basically, you know, once we were attacked at Pearl Harbor, um, everything became about the, the war effort and uh, totally understandable uh, that that was the priority. But it, in essence, erased Marion from the history books. Everything became about the war effort. And that was uh, December of 1941. It did not end until um, four years later in 1945. And um, I think everything, you know, everyone just wanted to get on with their lives. They wanted to put the war behind them. And what it also meant is that Marion got brushed aside uh, um, as well. So her legacy was, was mostly, you know, for the most part, you know, lost. Um, and um, the, the, the whole, um, you know, placing it uh, in the middle of such an important time period for this country, not just getting into World War II, but also uh, throughout the 1930s, when so many things were, were happening in, in the world. Um, in one aspect or one part of the book, I describe her um, sailing over to Europe to uh, take place in what's called the Curtis Cup, um, which is uh, an amateur competition between the United States, um, Great Britain and Ireland. And uh, it was, um, she was on three Curtis Cup teams, which is um, considered one of the great honors uh, in, in golf. But what I found uh, as I was researching it, of course, you know, I was checking, okay, the, the name of the, of the boat, uh, the ship rather that she sailed on. And I realized that it had been called um, something different and uh, named after um, um, a person of Jewish descent who, who had been an important uh, to the uh, country of Germany uh, where, the, where the ship originated. And once Hitler came in, he had changed the name of that ship. Um, that's a small detail, but it says so much based on what we know is, is coming in a few years. Um, it, it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's waiting, you know, it's saying, pay attention here. This, this is something uh, important uh, to, the, to the overall story of, of what will happen to the world in, in the next few years. Um, you know, she got to, um, to meet on two different occasions uh, the, the man who abdicated the crown uh, in, in, uh, in Great Britain, uh, who gave it up so that he could marry Wallace Simpson. So, and once you, you know, and I'm sure you've 
seen this, but once you look into that story and how it was dominating uh, the conversation in newspapers, not just uh, not just over uh, overseas, but here in the states as well, you know, you you just see it that uh, you know these these stories just captivated so much uh, public attention and. And Marion was living all through it. Um, so it, it felt totally on spot for me to interject, to put those little aspects in, to have her mother reading the newspaper where he officially abdicates, um, gives up the crown, and, you know, the reaction of this American uh, thousands of miles away. Um, it's just such a rich tapestry that you can use um, as, as part of the book, which I took advantage of. And she is something that they talk about her as the all-American girl, and she's the example, and she's a role model, and she's what America as a republic and not a monarchy, and some place you could go and your ambition, not where you were born, your talents could take you to the top. That's what that's exactly what her story was. And people noticed it at the time. And it's great that you restored it to us. One of the breadcrumbs, by the way, on the trail was her scrapbooks. And that's a great story that people can enjoy beyond the story of the book, but how you get that. And I imagine you getting those when I've heard you in other interviews describe how you picked those up. And I said, that, that just must have been the closest you ever felt to, to her or you certainly felt very close in that moment. So since I have you here now, how did that feel? How did those come into your possession? And what did that feel like to hold those there and see where she had pasted all these articles, some of which I've been scrolling here for people to see on YouTube? Surreal uh, is, is one way to describe it. Um, when I was just poking around in the very, very beginning of the research, I came in contact with this woman uh, who lived in Lexington, not far from where I am right now, as a matter of fact. And um, she said that she had these materials that belonged to Marion and they had been left in the basement uh, of a house that she had purchased. And she really didn't know what they were, but she had seen Marion's name. And so she invited me over and I went, uh, went over there and realized, you know, these were scrapbooks covering her, um, her entire career as, uh, as an amateur golfer. Um, it was interesting because um, in this, at the same time, um, there was a watch uh, that had belonged to Marion. There was a bracelet. And interesting to our gambling discussion early on, there was um, a small um, slot machine. Like they, they had these small uh, slot machines that they actually were pretty popular. You know, you could put them on top of your desk or your, um, you know, dresser or whatever. They were just, uh, you know, for individual use. And um, so, you know, I'm looking through these things and the woman says, you know, I, I really, I don't really know what I should do with it. And I said, well, you should give them to the Lexington Country Club, which was her home club. And because they need to be preserved. Well, I, I ended up moving away. I never knew what happened to these items. And, um, but when I came back to Kentucky and I actually was participating in a documentary that our public television network in the state was, um, was developing about Marion. And we were out at the club and they pull all these materials out of a, out of a closet and then I see the scrapbooks again. And, you know, it was really, it was really like just coming into contact with an old friend because um, I, the woman had allowed me to really study them and go through them. And um, so seeing them again, then I knew that, that you know, that they had been safe. And um, I did ask about that slot machine and everybody looks at me like I have three heads. Um, but uh, nobody knows anything about that, which, um, yeah, it, it was really, and so here, you know, uh, in her diary, she talks about purchasing that slot machine. Wow. 
And as it wasn't until I stumbled upon that, I wanted to like scream out, see, I'm not crazy. It really did exist. <laughs> yeah, it existed. I don't know what happened to it, but, um, but those scrapbooks now are safely held um, at the Lexington Country Club along with, uh, I, I didn't mention, but there were a set of her clubs uh, in that basement as well. And the, the watch. So, you know, the, the things were saved and, you know, did I feel closest to her then? I'll tell you when I really felt it was when I went up into the Lexington Country Club and I was in that hallway. That's, um, that's when I felt it the most because I, I knew, I knew the exact location of where she had fallen and, and where she had died. So that uh, became very real to me. It's interesting, the Lexington Country Club, uh, there are some people um, who say that there have been sightings uh, of um, the ghost, uh, but it's interesting, it's been children. Um, hmm. Children have seen something that's kind of unexplainable. So uh, I, I don't know. Um, Every time I'm there, I'm like, please, please let it be me. Let it be me, you know, but never happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because I was going to say maybe that's a symptom of people's minds because she's so alive. But that's a, a fascinating part of the story. Interesting detail. Yeah. You also in depth go into talking about the men who plan and execute this botched robbery. Execute, maybe not the greatest verb there, considering what happens to Marion. But your book, therefore has been compared to Truman Capote's In Cold Blood. And I certainly thought that when I was reading it because it's a fictionalized account of a real murder. And yet as a reader who does this sort of thing now for a living, I am critical, right? So I'm gonna say, oh, hey, you, you, you didn't do justice to this person. And my gosh, after knowing Marion Miley now, if you hadn't done her justice, I would feel really bad about it. And I would be saying, oh, I wish she left it to somebody else who really cared about and understood her. And didn't she know about the scrapbooks? And you know, people crank out some stuff that's not, they, they don't always get it. And so that's hard, it's hard to do. I'm not saying I would do a perfect job of it, but you know, some people will even write themselves a book and say, you know, I didn't really get that. I didn't understand golf. Someone else really had to help me or could have helped me or I was on a deadline, but you do just what Truman Capote did in a way you couldn't go see the men involved because they were executed for the crime. But like in cold blood, you describe this in a way that's so vivid and you do so with the help, not of one of the killers in Capote's case, but you go and you find one of the sons of one of the men. And even though he's changed his family name because they have this stigma that they bear and this, this generational guilt. And because of that, I thought that was a challenge for you. You had to call this person, you had to find them first of all, under another name. And then you had to convince them to open up to you on something that was so shameful and so painful to them. So when you first contact this person and you, you keep the name to yourself because it's, it's private and it's not the, the sins of the father here for anybody involved, but you had to talk to that person and say, <laughs> say in the best way possible, I know who you are. I have no, and, and before they hang up on you or however you contact them, get them to want to answer and convince them that I want to tell the story respectfully. So please help me have that side of the story. How do you go about getting mm -hmm. that person to open up and give you that information and to trust you to keep their secret secret and leave these things in the past, even as you're asking them to dig them up here in the present? I was very, very fortunate uh, in that aspect of the story. Um, it was actually um, a friend who helped me find this person. Uh, like you said, he's the son of one of the three men who uh, committed the crime and who was executed for it. Uh, the son was, was just a little boy when it happened. Um, his name had been changed. Uh, um, he and his sister. Um, so, because there was just so much shame associated um, with this crime, Marion was so loved. Um, and, you know, the, the man who was executed, you know, he lived locally and um, his family was known. But anyway, so the children's names were changed and, um, 
you know, I'm a pretty good researcher, but I couldn't find them. I, I, I did everything I could think of to, to try and find those kids. And I finally decided their names were changed. Um, and that's the reason why I can't find them. And, uh, I don't know if it was the universe smiling down on me or what, but somebody I knew um, came to me and said, I think I know the person. I think I know the son who, who you're looking for. Um, and, you know, there were several other people in this setting when this happened and they've all said the same thing that the, the look on my face, you know, when he told me and just, you know, just the, the shock and, uh, and just, you know, happiness really that, that, that I had found him. So it was my friend who kind of smoothed that way. And then I was able to, uh, to go in and sit down um, with, with his son who was, was in his seventies, uh, you know, at that point, um, it was, um, it was a very, um, it, it, it really, um, kind of, uh, tugged at my heart a little bit, um, when I sat down with him, um, very, very nice man. He, he had been protected. He and his sister had been protected from the story, um, it, so they didn't know all the details uh, until they got a little older. And um, I'll tell you, Dean, the, probably the, one of the things that really just kind of stopped me cold was we were sitting in this very small kitchen across the table from one another. And he said, well, you know, um, I, I was told that, that my dad wasn't even there in the apartment. That it, that it was the other man and, and he was outside. And um, is that true? Hey. And, and I, you know, lots of things going through your mind. And I just said, um, no, no, that, that isn't true. He, he was in the apartment. But I will tell you one thing, um, your father didn't kill anybody. It was the other man. They, they proved that. Um, through the uh, ballistics and, and the shell casings, you know, two totally different guns uh, used in this horribly botched robbery. And um, so his, his father had not shot anybody, hadn't killed anybody. But, you know, I think about that sometimes um, sitting down with him. Um, and I, I think that I was able to draw on my previous um, career experience um, in several pieces for uh, magazine pieces that I had done earlier. They were extremely sensitive. Uh, they dealt with very tragic um, stories. You know, one example, uh, it was uh, an Air Force jet that uh, they had engine failure while the pilot was flying it and he crashed and um, killed 10 people. And um, I sat down with uh, family members uh, of nine of those 10 people who were killed. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's raw. That's very raw in terms of their loss and how suddenly it happened. And it was just a crisscross of ages and, um, young, you know, young people, uh, uh, teenagers and, and parents, uh, uh, young parents, and it, it was really heartbreaking. And I think in a situation like that, when you have a difficult, a difficult story, and that was only uh, one um, story that, that I did that was, was so difficult, you have to listen. You know, it sounds like such a basic thing, but you have to slow yourself down and listen to what the person is saying. And you have to listen to how they're saying it. And so for me interviewing, uh, Tom Penny was, uh, was the man who uh, was one of the people responsible for the crime. It was his son. You know, I had to just 
sit and be patient, which people who know me will tell you that's not one of my strongest uh, suits, but to slow myself down, to be patient and let him speak. Um, Because that's how you respect the person. That's how you respect your subject that you're, you you know, that you're, you're trying to, um, you know, get the full, you know, the, uh, the full perspective on it. And so I was really grateful for some of those experiences that I had er- earlier um, where I had to talk to people under very difficult circumstances. The other two men, by the way, are Robert H. Anderson, who's a Louisville nightclub owner, right? And mm-hmm. uh, kind of a sketchy character. And then the groundskeeper, whose name is Raymond Baxter, but they call him Skeeter. And I mean, who who can trust a guy named Skeeter after that? It sounds so fun, but it's, I I leave them to the end. I try to leave the, the killers to the end. And also because I just don't want to let the person's life be defined by that flash of a gun when they die tragically or die violently. And it's another similarity between your book, The Murder of Marion Miley, and the book In Cold Blood is that adding to the tragedy is that the burglars imagine up this huge cache of money and that they're going to make this huge score and they think it'll be easy and they, they go into it and there's nothing there. In the case of Truman Capote's book, it's this safe that doesn't exist. In fact, the man doesn't even have any cash on hand. He does everything by check. And in the case of this dance where they think they're going to get this big score, there's, there's nothing there. So it's, it's, just so tragic that it adds another level on top of her tragedy of the tragedy of the murder of Mary and Miley. I do want to wrap up with that line though, that, that idea of not letting victims of violent deaths become defined by that act. You know, I don't want Mary and Miley to forever be laying there lifeless in that hallway. I want to remember her standing on the links or maybe pumping gas into the, into the car for, for a publicity shot at a standard oil ad or writing her poetry, riding a horse, even, even placing a bet there at Keeneland. You brought her to life so much here in your novel that I can just see her there cheering, clutching that, you know, clutching the stub of her, for her horse that she's picked in the ninth race or whatever she might have been wagering on at the time. So I wanted her to be alive like that for me. So I wanted to ask you to leave listeners with something that helps them remember. What do you hope when they finish the book after they've been separated from the beginning and they get to your end, which I have not read yet to keep myself pure for the interview, but once they put the book down, how do you hope that readers will remember Marion Miley as a golfer, as a woman, a poet, a writer, somebody who was so inspirational and stolen away from us way too soon? I like to think of this book as a celebration of a life, even with the title, even with the the raw facts of the story. Um, I totally agree with you, not ending um, something with, um, you know, a victim, you know, sprawled on a a floor. Um, I really wanted to convey that this was an extraordinary life. And we should know about it. Um, a person with so many gifts and so many talents and, you know, known all over the country and, and even the world. Um, and, you know, the fact that all of this is stolen away, you know, when, when she was 27, it in no way affects what the, you know, what her legacy should be um, what she left as a legacy, that all still exists. And um, people should, should know about it. Um, yes, you, you can't deny uh, the tragedy of it. But in the same sense, you can't deny who she was and, and all that she accomplished and, and um, all of her, of her special gifts. So that's that's really, um, yeah, what, what I hope people um, take away from the book and, uh, I, you know, at least from, uh, from some of the readers, you know, that I've heard um, from, um, it seems like they are getting that. And I'm just 
I'm so happy uh, about it. Uh, you know, when we worked on the documentary a few years ago, the producer said to me uh, at one point, because I, I was a pretty active uh, participant in that documentary, and she said, you know, Beverly, it's, it's like we're bringing Marion back alive. And I said, yes, yes. And so that's what I hope happens with this book. Well, Beverly Bell, you certainly did that for me today. And also when I read the book, The Murder of Marion Miley, you restored her, which is just so great. She was really an inspiring star athlete, but also just a great person, somebody with so much to give. And she can still give us inspiration today, even after she has passed away now 80 years ago. But thanks to your book and the documentary that you mentioned, which is excellent, we can meet her again. We can get a taste of the measure of fame that she earned before her life was cut tragically short. I thank you for sprinkling out the breadcrumbs today. I hope that readers will all be good little pigeons and follow them along, right? Not ter terribly complimentary to all of us. We None of us want to be thought of as pigeons, but hey, I didn't say lemmings. So enjoy the breadcrumbs. There you follow go. them, please, to your bookstore and pick up a copy of The Murder of Marion Miley. It's a great book. And I bet in in tribute to Mary, and I bet that this will be a bestseller. Congratulations. It's a great book. Thank you so much, Dean. This has been so much fun. And as you know, and I don't get tired of talking about her. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, people should definitely go to beverlybell.com or Beverly K. Bell, rather, right, is your yes, website. Middle initial, so yeah. I, I didn't mention it in the middle, but yeah, it's an excellent website and you get to see some of these pictures. She's, she's put it all out there and for just a great subject. So I appreciate you writing the book and speaking with me today. Thank you. Again, the book is The Murder of Marion Miley. But the book is so much more than her death. It's about her life and a celebration of it. And what a life it was. She packed a lot into those 27 years. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at the historyauthor.com page for this episode. By buying a book through us, you help keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. I wanna thank Beverly Bell again for joining us and also for doing such a great service to history. Marion Miley is a legend and an inspiration, and it's just too bad that, unfortunately, with all the death in the Second World War, the tragic death of a golfer just didn't really keep headlines when it was years and years later. But Kentucky does a great job in remembering her, it remembers its heroes well. And I hope you'll visit Beverly K. Bell. I know that when you go to beverlykbell.com, you'll say, wow, Look at this woman. She's still so alive, Marion Miley. The pictures are just great. It's a little heartbreaking, but I hope that I did my job and we focus on her life and not her untimely death. And speaking of Kentucky, thank you to everybody who's subscribing on YouTube. You can see I decided to don my hat that I got at Keeneland, but also I whipped out a bottle of Cask Strength Maker's Mark. I talk a lot about enjoying the occasional bourbon, and so I decided that since I dipped this bottle myself, I would pull it out here on the show and have a little toast here to Marion Miley because I'm so inspired by her. Remember, you can find me at historyauthor.com or on Twitter at History Dean, Facebook, and Instagram. You know, I like to put up a lot of shots with, wow, that's a healthy pour, huh? So this is the good stuff. But anyway, I want to thank you all so much for joining me today and for hearing a little bit about this forgotten American hero. Here's to all of you, but especially to Marion Miley and the fine people of Kentucky. I hope that if you have an opportunity to go to Lexington, you'll check out some of these places that we discussed, including Keeneland and including the great golf course that is still there where she unfortunately died. But her life is so much more than just those gunshots. She really is still an inspiration, certainly to me and I hope to all of you. So until our next trip into the past together, Here's to all of you, and thank you for time traveling with us. We'll see you next time. Things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.